If you own a Mac made within the last decade, chances are you've probably run into issues with lack of ports, or if you've got your machine tucked away at your desk like I do, those ports aren't very accessible. The simplest solution to this problem is to buy a USB hub or a dock, but there are literally hundreds of different models out there, and there are a number of things to consider when you're shopping for these. There's obvious things like build quality and the number of ports, but also what speed or specs those ports have what kind of power the hub needs or can provide to your Mac, and other important factors like external display compatibility and SD card support. Just getting a handle on all of that can be a task in itself, but on top of that, there's a lot of overpriced or underpowered products out there, and frankly, a lot of them just aren't great quality. So today, I not only want to break down what a lot of these things mean and what to look out for, but I've also bought and tested a bunch of hubs and docks over the last year that I can recommend, or at the very least you can use as a baseline for what to look out for. So if you're looking for a USB hub or a dock for yourself or for someone else, or you're just curious to see or hear about some of this gear or the new advancements being made and new stuff that's coming out, stick around and let's get into it. Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. When it comes to external accessories for Macs or PCs, Everyone is going to have different needs, and knowing what you need is not only a good first step in finding something that you'll be satisfied with, but it can also save you some money as well. I find that most folks often don't need to buy the most expensive option available, but are usually in the middle somewhere, and that's why I like to break these hub videos down into three separate categories. There's lower tier inexpensive options, mid-range options with more features and better performance, and higher end stuff that's the best of the best. I'm going to go through each category separately and explain a lot of what the important specs mean along the way. I'll also have links to all the products that I mentioned in the description if you want to check any of these out, but let's just start off with some lower end affordable options. These can be really cheap, but just be aware that the cheapest options out there generally aren't very good. They'll often be built poorly and some of them still only have USB 2.0, which for those of you who don't know, is a USB standard that's almost 25 years old now. That has a maximum transfer speed of 480 megabits or 60 megabytes per second, meaning that it's really not all that useful these days outside of connecting simple peripherals like a keyboard or a mouse. To put that into perspective, a high def movie that's around 5 gigabytes in size will end up taking several minutes to transfer over USB 2, where the same file over USB 3.0 will take roughly 10 to 20 seconds, which is why I start with USB 3.0 minimum and what this Anchor 332 hub is that I have here. Anchor is a really well known brand in this space, so right off the hop you know that you're not buying junk, and I believe these come with an 18 month warranty and are usually priced between 20 and 30 bucks USD. This particular hub and ones like it are great for anyone who's using basic peripherals, along with most thumb drives and external hard drives because most of those won't ever go faster than what USB 3.0 can provide. They're also fantastic for accessories like webcams, and with the Anchor 332 hub having two USB-A and two USB-C ports, it gives you a good balance of each connection type. It's also got an HDMI port for connecting an external display, which is nice to have, but there is a bit of a catch with that, which I'll come back to in a second, but the big selling feature for me with this is it has up to 85 watts of pass-through power delivery. That means that I can plug in a charger into the port labeled PD on here, be it my MacBook charger or a GAN charger, and it'll output up to 85 watts to my MacBook while powering everything else connected to the hub. The higher end MacBook Pros almost always use less than 60 watts even at max output, so with 85 you've got more than enough available, and having it power the hub itself gives you an adequate amount of power for anything connected here, and makes things a lot less prone to failure. Coming back to that HDMI port, the thing that you want to take note of here, and with most of these cheaper hubs for that matter, is it advertises it's good for 4K output, but it's only up to 30Hz, which if you're using a 4K monitor, is gonna look pretty bad. That means your screen only refreshes 30 times per second, and anything below 60 is really choppy with any movement or scrolling, so I don't find this particularly useful, and it hangs around on lower resolutions as well, which is unfortunate. If running your monitor from a hub is a must-have, you can find similarly priced hubs that offer 4K at 60Hz 
but you often have to make some trade-offs either with the port selection or the build quality. I would say if you're starting to look at those specs, normally your best bet is just one step up from this price range and into the more mid-range options. Mid-range hubs start at around 50 bucks and you normally get a whole bunch of added or improved features as well, but for me, it's also one of the hardest tiers to find products that are well thought out and usable. And I'll tell you why that is. This is where you're gonna find the biggest mix of low end and mid to high end specs and they're often not very well thought out, especially for modern devices, which all starts with the USB ports. As I said previously, the minimum spec that you want to look at these days with USB is version 3.0, but there are more and more things that run on versions higher than this, specifically phones and external SSDs, and even some nicer 4K webcams. USB versioning is an absolute mess right now, so you'll see version 3.0 and 3.2 Gen 1 listed sometimes, which are the exact same thing and both run at 5 gigabits per second. The same goes for USB 3.1 and 3.2 Gen 2 that run at 10 gigabits. And without diving into why you often see different versions for the exact same spec, you're better off just looking at the listed transfer speed, which should show up somewhere on the product listing or in the branding. With that said, the next jump up is 10 gigabits per second, where if you're doing things like gaming, editing photos, or batch processing, or transferring a lot of photos, and really anything where there's a large amount of data being moved, there's gonna be a noticeable increase in speed versus a five gigabit per second port. In my opinion, any mid-range hub should offer 10 gigabit per second ports, but the problem that I find is that even when they do, they'll also have a mix of USB 3.0 or even 2.0 ports that are predominantly USB-A connectors with a lack of USB-C ports, which at this stage, almost every new product releases with and has for quite some time now. On top of that, you'll find other port types aren't great as well. You'll still occasionally find underwhelming HDMI ports and more often than not, SD card reader speeds are pretty terrible. Taking all that into consideration, it's hard to find a hub that has modern specs on all the ports offered without a premium price attached, but there are some out there, one of which is this Satechi Multiport 8K hub. This comes in at $99, has outstanding build quality, and I would say is just about the best value hub that you can buy right now. You've got three USB-C ports at 10 gigabit per second speeds and one at 5 gigabits. There's a UHS-2 SD card reader that has great speed. UHS-2 readers are often one of the harder things to find in mid-range hubs. You'll usually see UHS-1 readers that are three times slower than UHS-2 in them, so if you're transferring a lot of photos or videos, UHS-2 makes a world of difference and can be a huge time saver. This Satechi hub also has a 1 gig Ethernet port if you prefer to use a wired network connection, an HDMI port that will do 4K at 60Hz, and has power delivery up to 85 watts as well. I'd say for most people, especially for a portable solution, something like this is going to be an amazing little hub and serve you quite well. If that's still not enough for you and you want something even more powerful or maybe you just want the best of the best, that's where we get into Thunderbolt or USB 4 hubs and docks, which are more high-end or premium solutions but also come with high-end price tags. These usually start at around $200 and up and will come advertised with Thunderbolt 3 or 4 or USB 4 speeds, all of which are capable of 40 gigabit per second transfer speeds. If you're using those connections to hook up external Thunderbolt SSDs, they will actually outperform the internal drives on a lot of Macs, which is kind of wild. For myself, I generally offload a lot of my storage onto my external SSD that's in a Thunderbolt enclosure, and most transfers between that and my Mac are instantaneous. You can also run external displays through Thunderbolt and USB 4, where they're going to be able to run a 4K display up to 120 Hz or higher in some cases. And just in general, anything that you have hooked up to these ports, provided that they're USB 4 or Thunderbolt devices themselves, are going to be ultra fast. Also, just a side note, a USB 4 accessory will still give you similar speeds when you put it on a Thunderbolt dock and vice versa, as they share a lot of the same underlying technology. 
So they are kind of interchangeable in that sense. These docks haven't really changed all that much over the last few years in terms of what the best options are, but in terms of power, these are very different from the pass-through power hubs that we've gone over up to this point. Premium docks are going to have their own power source or adapter, and usually they'll have a big brick that comes with them to effectively power everything. So they're definitely not the most portable things in the world, but there is one that I've recently tried that solved this problem and finally put a modern power solution inside of it. This is the Hyper Thunderbolt 4 dock with an integrated GAN power source. GAN stands for gallium nitride, which is a semiconductor material that allows power components to be more efficient and made much smaller. You usually see this tech in high output wall adapters like these, but in this case, they've just included it inside the dock, so all you need is a power cord. Previously, even if you had something small like the pluggable Thunderbolt hub or the CalDigit element hub, you still had this big honking AC adapter, which kind of negated the compact size of the hub. So having everything internal on here is much easier and nicer to deal with. This Hyper Thunderbolt 4 hub comes in at $299, so it's not the cheapest Thunderbolt hub that you can get, but still a lot cheaper than some other solutions, and it gives you three usable Thunderbolt 4 ports outside of the one connected to your machine, which provides you with up to 96 watts power delivery as well. Obviously you only get Thunderbolt ports with that one though, and if you want something with a boatload of ports, my personal favorite is still the CalDigit TS4, although it is a lot more pricey, coming in at $399, so $100 more than the Hyperhub. On the front of that, you'll find regular and micro-sized DHS2 SD readers, a headphone jack, a 10 gigabit USB-A port, and two USB-C 10 gigabit ports, one of which has 20 watts power output, which is great for fast charging devices like phones that support it. On the back, you've got four USB-A ports, all of which have 10 gigabit speeds, a 3.5 millimeter audio in and out, 2.5 gig ethernet port, DisplayPort 1.4 port that can output 4K at 120Hz or 8K at 60, a USB-C port that does 10 gigabit speeds, and three Thunderbolt 4 ports, one of which you'll need to hook up to your Mac that also gives you 98 watts power delivery. You'll also notice that you've got a power plug in the back, which does connect to a rather large power brick, but once that's out of the way, this is a phenomenal dock. As I mentioned, I have my external Thunderbolt SSD connected to this at all times, and I edit all of these videos from it, and I'm constantly using both SD card slots on here, along with pretty much all the ports, and I've never had one issue with it before. You might notice that mine looks quite a bit different from the standard TS4, and that's because I've taken off the faceplate and designed and 3D printed my own. I did the same thing with a little SSD cooler that I made beside it, and if you guys have a TS4 and you want the STL file for printing that off yourself, let me know in the comments down below and I'll provide that if there is enough interest. With all of that said regarding premium docks, I do just want to mention that within the next year or so, there's going to be some brand new stuff coming out that will blow these specs out of the water. Thunderbolt 5 was announced in late 2023 and some manufacturers like Hyper have already shown off Thunderbolt 5 docks they're working on, so I suspect we'll start seeing those slowly trickle out over the next year or so. The other side of that is to get the most out of those docks, you'll want a PC or Mac that has Thunderbolt 5 support, which currently doesn't exist. So maybe the next iteration of MacBooks will have that, but regardless, the specs are super impressive. It will have up to 120 gigabit per second transfer speeds, which is four times faster than the current generation, and as far as powering monitors, it has the potential to run gaming monitors up to 540 hertz, or run three 4K monitors at once at 144 hertz, which is a huge step forward. That will likely change the landscape of the premium stuff offered here, and I'm sure it will benefit some people and others not so much, and that really goes for anything that I've mentioned here. The most important part in all of this is just to find out how you use your machine, what accessories you need, and work your way out from there. That way you're not going to end up with something that you don't need or you don't like, and is generally a little bit easier on the wallet as well. It's also good to have a bit of an understanding of how all this stuff works, and I hope this was helpful in that regard. If it was, or if you enjoyed this video, feel free to hit that like button. Also, if you'd like to see more tech-related content, or help me create a smart speaker that pretends to be an old-timey radio announcer when it plays music, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next upload.